Hi, I'm Nicole Repka, our Chief Marketing Officer here at Jackson Control. Thanks for joining us today for our indoor air quality webinar. Today, we're going to talk about some common sources that contribute to indoor pollutants and some technologies that can help improve indoor air quality and the overall health of a building. So I'll pass it off to Matt Montgomery and we'll get started. All righty. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we'll kick it off by asking the following question. So how contaminated is indoor air quality? Um, well, to answer that, on average, Americans spend about 90% of their time indoors. And if you really think about it, whether it's at the office or at home, when you're inside in an enclosed space, you're exposed to many contaminants that would be more diluted or even non-existent outside. Matter of fact, uh, indoor air concentrations of pollutants are about two to five times higher than typical outdoor concentrations. So items such as smokeless heating fuels, dust, combustion particles, organic compounds, pollen, pet dander, smoke, microorganisms like fungus, virus, mold, bacteria, and even carbon dioxide and chemical vapors um, all play a vital role in a person's well-being, health, and productivity. So in regards to the health risks for IAQ, the EPA has ranked indoor air quality as a top five environmental risk to public health, and poor ventilation is one of the leading factors of poor IAQ. So in fact, the EPA also notes that indoor air quality concentrations of pollutants have increased in recent times due to factors such as energy efficient buildings that lack mechanical ventilation for air changes and increased use of synthetic building materials, furnishings, personal care products, pesticides, and household cleaners. So let's look at some of the more common indoor air contaminants. So the first one is good old fashioned carbon dioxide or CO2. Uh, CO2 is a byproduct of combustion as well as a result of the metabolic process in living organisms. Uh, indoor concentrations without ventilation can quickly reach 1,000 parts per million when we compare that to outdoor concentrations that are about 350 to 450 parts per million. The next is VOCs or volatile organic compounds. These are man-made chemicals that are used in nearly every manufacturing process, paint, stains, aerosols, uh, cleaners, disinfectants, air fresheners, stored fuels, furnishings, and pesticides are all common sources of VOCs. The next are fine particulates or particulate matter or abbreviated PM. Uh, PM is the term used for a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets that are found in air. Examples of particulate matter would be dust and dirt and smoke and soot and pollen. Uh, they're characterized by size and then usually defined as PM 2.5, which is 2.5 micrometers or smaller, or PM 10, which is 10 micrometers or smaller. Just to put that in perspective, the human hair is about 70 micrometers in diameter. Uh, the next would be microbial contaminants. These are viruses, bacteria, mold, and skin dander. And then lastly, we have ozone. So just a little, little uh, summary on ozone. In the upper atmosphere, ozone's beneficial chemical, which shields us from UV radiation emitted by the sun. The formation of ozone in the lower atmosphere occurs when sunlight hits certain pollutants, or VOCs. This is commonly known as smog. So when smog or ozone is at ground level, it, it can be harmful to people when inhaled. Uh, the smog can infiltrate interior spaces, but it should be noted that it also does form inside as well. So certain air purifiers, laundry water treatment applications, electric motors, photocopiers, uh, and vegetable washers are all common sources where ozone occurs inside. So. Um, taking it a step further, looking at the health effects of poor IAQ, um, I think this slide's pretty powerful. I'll just, I'll just rattle through some, and these are, these are defined by the American Lung Association. So we have dryness and irritation of the eyes, nose, throat, and skin, headache, fatigue, shortness of breath, hypersensitivity and allergies, sinus congestion, coughing, sneezing, dizziness, and nausea. Some of these stats there on the right are pretty eye-opening. Um, all right, so what are the key parameters of indoor air quality? Um, let's start with particulate matter. Uh, as we already talked about, PM is defined by size, and it's usually broken into two subcategories, 10 micrometers or less, which is PM10, or 2.5 micrometers or less, which is PM2.5. Carbon monoxide would be anywhere less than nine parts per million. 
uh, VOCs, less than 500 micrograms per cubic meter of air. Formaldehyde, less than 27 parts per billion. Carbon dioxide, about 700 parts per million above outdoor air levels, usually about 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million. Humidity, humidity, ideally between 30 and 50%. And temperature, 68.5 to 74 in the winter and 75 to 80.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. So with all that being said, what can we do to improve IAQ? Um, today we'll focus and rally around a three-prong approach, which includes UV lights, ventilation, and ionization. We shall start with UV lights. So a high level overview of the electromagnetic spectrum as it relates to ultraviolet rays and sanitation. So UV light covers a wavelength spectrum from 100 to 380 nanometers, and it's subdivided into three regions. Uh, number one is UVA. This is about 320 to 400 nanometers. And this is the most abundant when we see sunlight. It's the most abundant UV when we see sunlight and it's responsible for skin tanning and wrinkles. UVB, which is 280 to 320 nanometers. It's primarily responsible for skin reddening and skin cancer. And then finally we have UVC. Today we'll be focusing around UVC. UVC is 200 to 280 nanometers and it's the most effective wavelength for germicidal control. It should be noted that any UV under 200 nanometers can produce ozone when introduced with oxygen. So UVC as it relates to disinfection, um, as we already talked about, UVA and UVB light will kill some bacteria and germs, but are mostly ineffective against viruses like COVID-19. UVC energy at 253.7 nanometers provides the most precise and most germicidal effect. Uh, UVC exposure inactivates microbial organisms such as bacteria, and viruses by altering the structure and the molecular bonds of the DNA and ROA. I'm sorry, and RNA. The, this destroys their ability to reproduce. Uh, UVC light can also inactivate up to 99.9% .9 of other pathogens like mold spores and fungus. And it should be noted UVC is a great tool for disinfecting air and surfaces. So, Talking about UVC and deployment in HVAC settings, we'll focus on two of the most common applications. The first being coil cleaning, and this is what you primarily see UVC light being used in an HVAC setting. So the benefits to coil cleaning are that it cleans the biofilm buildup around the coil. Biofilm is just mold and dust that accumulates over time. It eliminates and prevents the buildup of organic material. There is a measurable return on investment through increases in efficiency uh, of the HVAC system. It's been said that a biofilm buildup of just 0 0.006 of an inch will lower efficiency by 16%. Um, you'll get longer equipment life, lower energy and maintenance costs. It does eliminate odor. It does decrease the need for chemical cleaning procedures. And a real neat one that I think personally gets overlooked is water conservation. So if you think about it, the water condensate that's coming down the coil is distilled water once UVC is introduced, and it can be reused as cooling tower uh, makeup water. So the second HVAC setting would be a duct mounted solution. Um, the primary benefits to this would be sterilization of the air cycling through the ductwork, um, breaking it down a step further. Uh, we can customize um, that deployment of UVC and ductwork. So if you have a multi-office building that is being conditioned by the same equipment, let's just say you have three tenants, tenant A wants to invest in UV lights, but tenant B and C don't, uh, you can install in the ductwork supplying tenant A um, to get the uh, disinfecting um, outcome. So moving forward, how to scope out a coil application. Um, simply answered, you can, you can call us, any one of the market leaders at Jackson Control, and it'd be our pleasure to scope it out for you. Um, what you should look for, and if you talk to us, we'll probably ask you the following. So we'll ask you about coil dimensions. We'll look at bulb power. We'll want to look at distance and duration. We'll want to take note of any shadowing or blind spots. We'll want to look at mounting and safety measures, such as... Um, door disconnect contacts and viewports. Uh, we can come up with a nice little design here. 
uh, that'll show the intensity of the light as it relates to placement. And then in regards to specking out a duck mounted solution, same thing, call us. Uh, we'll ask you for the duck dimensions, what the CFM look like, uh, looks like rather, what your access looks like, and we can generate a scope for you. Uh, one thing to take into consideration with duck solutions is the desired kill rate. It directly drives the amount of lights and spacing that will be used. For example, a desired rate of 99.1% would yield X amount of lights and 99.9% .9 would yield that much more. So something to take into consideration. So um, taking it a step further um, from deploying UVC would be the monitoring of the ultraviolet lights and the maintenance. So in regards to monitoring, we have a device called the Gen UV where we can monitor the intensity of the UV light and bring it into a BAS front end to show a nice graphic on the UV light intensity for maintenance purposes. The, sensor is individual, the sensors are individually calibrated for four to 20 milliamps. And we can show a nice, nice graphic on that. And then in regards to just good old fashioned regular maintenance, typically the bulbs are replaced uh, every two years or 16 to 18,000 hours. Uh, but that does vary a bit based on manufacturer. And then as it relates to UV disinfection for surfaces, um, it, uh, it's worth noting that UV can certainly be deployed outside of a typical HVAC setting for on-demand and automated surface disinfection. So here are just a few examples of these solutions. Um, we've got uh, Honeywell air purifiers for on-demand and we've got Puro Halo. Uh, air purifiers, which are deployed in any, any type of, uh, of unoccupied uh, surface disinfection setting that we would like. So that, that is uh, all she wrote for UV. I'm going to kick it over to Mr. Stephen Heckler now to talk about ventilation and flushing. Unmuting. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so ventilation and flushing. Where does that start? Well, you have Jack Skellington there saying, what's this? Because it's typically what happens when you first start to look at ventilation and flushing. Uh, much like everything we deal with, it has to do with math, mathematical equation. And what we're looking for is ACH, which is uh, air changes per hour. So the equation shown here and the variables are what is used to calculate contamination removal. Uh, you use that, that equation to look for a 95% clearance as a minimum, which is ASHRAE guidelines out of 62.1, which we'll mention a few times as we go through here. And that typically uh, requires three air changes per hour or equivalent. So if you're using equipment to get those air changes, or if you're just using openings like doors and windows to get those air changes, you can run that calculation and use that to create a program or just figure out how often you should open a window um, to get that air moving. Because an essential, requ essential requirement for ventilation is that air never stops moving. It's not simply that fresh air is being brought in or that you're heating air, that you're cooling air, or that you're filtering air. Just by the act of moving air, you are helping with ventilation and you're helping treat that air. And of course, that brings up more math, uh, which everyone loves. But this particular equation is used to determine something that I think is a uh, well, it's necessary to know, but the way they word it is disgusting. So that little cue with the dot over it, that is a, a, a variable for quanta and is the net emission rate of quanta for infected individuals actively shedding in the room. So as I'm sitting here, I'm actually next to Matt. There's my hand waving around. So he's breathing, I'm breathing, we're shedding stuff. That's why it's kind of gross to think about, but that's the whole point of ventilation and the whole point of uh, controlling your indoor air quality. You know, we've been wrapped up with uh, thinking about temperature control and humidity control and comfort control uh, for years. And there has been not as much focus as there should be on what else is in the air. So we take an equation like that and there's three determination pro procedures. Uh, the first one is the ventilation rate procedure. So you base that on your typical space contaminant sources and their strengths. So for that one, you wouldn't necessarily have a control system the way we would look at it. We would look at the building, what equipment is there, how many people are in there, what the source of contaminants are, and then you set that equipment to always do the same thing every day. 
In the IAQ procedure, this is what you would use to uh, create a control sequence of operations to control buildings. So you calculate your rates based on the analysis of contaminant sources, concentrations, and IAQ targets. And you do that live with IAQ sensors. Uh, and you feed that into your automation system. You look at the quality of the air, and then it can make decisions and use its programming to bring in fresh air, disinfect the air, even send an alert in the worst cases and ask people to leave a space. And then the natural ventilation rate procedure, which you do see in a lot of old school buildings uh, that just don't have an ability to control ventilation, that is the calculation for air through, uh, through openings, which simply means you should open the window or open a door or whatever you have to let outside air into that space manually, um, periodically. So uh, I think, oh, thank you. It's ventilation and flushing. Where did that go? There it is. Okay, so that first little link on that slideshow, that is a site that uh, a lot of people don't know is there. That's airnow.gov. So you can come to airnow.gov and you can type in any locality and see what the outside air quality is that day. Because we start talking about treating indoor air, one of the biggest things you'll hear is bring in outside air, which is great, unless the outside air is worse than the inside air. So you have to see that. And much like we would use a weather service in a typical building automation system, we can use a, a data transfer module to connect to airnow.gov see the outside air quality and then decide, should we really let in outside air or should we try to treat the air that's inside the building? Which is why you would need things like UV lights in your duct, better air filters, ionization. Um, so in a, in a situation where you can't bring in outside air. If you don't connect to a site like that, um, you can install an outdoor air quality sensor. Uh, we have a lot of outdoor air sensors that are just sensing temperature and humidity, so you can get the, your enthalpy readings for demand control, control ventilation. Uh, you do very similar. You have an air, outdoor air quality sensor. You're looking at that outdoor air quality, scanning it, comparing it to the indoor air quality, and then deciding whether or not uh, you can bring in that outside air and how much. Or if you should just start cycling the air more, uh, create, increase your air changes per hour uh, through the system if you can't bring in the, uh, the outside air. Uh, and one, let me see, do we want to stop there and show the SenseAware dashboard? I think so. I think that would make sense before we go to DOAS units. We'll show a dashboard. This is a pretty neat product that can stand alone or can be integrated with a building automation system. So this is a product called SenseAware and this is a dashboard, uh, which we'll find very, very helpful. I think this is a mobile unit demo but you can see all your measurements. And not only do you see the measurements of temperature, humidity, CO2, particulate matters, and VOCs, but it's telling you whether or not those are good readings because just those numbers in the, alone uh, don't, they don't mean anything unless you know where you're supposed to be. Uh, you can go historically, uh, it keeps record of history. So you can see if there was bad areas, if you have certain trends as more people come in and out of the building, or say you are in a process facility or you're near a facility that's industrial process, you can see how their operations affect your day. And you can uh, check those histories and know what to do either manually or as you're integrating it into your automation system where you should, you should treat the air. So this is something you can contact us about. We talk about SenseAware, building a dashboard and integrating that into your automation system. So controls. Controls cannot solve quite everything. When you think of a control system, a lot of times uh, you get, you get uh, in situations where the simplest explanation is, say you have a TV and you smash your TV with a hammer and then you have your remote control, which is the control system, and you're pointing at the TV and you say, no matter how many times I hit this button, the TV doesn't come on. Well, you need a new TV, right? So the control system, you can program all these great sequences and all this great programming in there, but if the equipment of that building doesn't have the ability to do those things, no amount of programming will turn that equipment into what you need. So that's where dedicated outdoor air systems come into play, uh, which you would commonly install them in a new build uh, to get that outdoor air and control it properly, or you'd replace a traditional package unit with that. So Jack's Control is now carrying DOAS, and they can help with controlling ventilation, humidity, building pressure. There are, is energy savings uh, that can be had, and I think 
we've probably built, built this up uh, a whole bunch of times over the years, but whenever you have an economizer, you'll see that reduction of outside air being brought in when you can. And also now, looking at IAQ, it used to totally be based on temperature uh, and that energy savings of outside air against indoor air. Now we're looking at IAQ, but you're still gonna recognize an ongoing savings of six to 12% per year, which typically, if you're replacing a standard package unit with a DOAS unit, with an IAQ sequence, you can still pay off an initial investment of the equipment in three years or less. So that's an analysis we can show. We have tools for that as well. As I was saying, Jackson is now uh, can now sell DOAS units. I don't think uh, Jackson Control has an intention to get into the large metal equipment business, but we are definitely in the air door, indoor air quality and life safety business. And a DOAS unit is a big piece of that offering. So we can specify uh, at the bottom of this slide, there is a link, uh, which anyone who requests this slideshow can get it. That link takes you right to the brochure of the DOAS unit that we sell. And there is a, there is a software package that we can give a login to that goes to a, a piece of software called iSelect. And you can enter in all your requirements for what you need out of a DOAS unit, and it'll specify the exact DOAS, give you the engineering specs that you can sell, show to your engineer or your building owner, and then uh, we can offer pricing for that. Um, and at that point, you would be looking for a contractor to install. Uh, all those units that we have, they are they, you, they can be had in three to 50 ton applications. I'm, I'm still on the last slide for a second. <laughs> But I got it right. Three to 50 ton applications. Good thing I looked at it right before. Anyway. So and then zero to 100 percent outside air. And again, you need that total control from zero to 100 uh, percent to get that true control of bringing in the proper amount of indoor air at the right time. Uh, and all of them have options for air purification, controls, economizers and VFDs. Controls, economizers and VFDs are very common. The air purification part even other products and other manufacturers have had ionization as an option on their units for a long time, and it just has never gotten checked. And now we're in a time when those things are being looked at and getting checked, and you can order them with the straight from the factory. Okay, now we can go. Thank you. So, since I mentioned some energy savings, uh, there is the 33300 rule which is just a part of understanding what it costs to actually run a building. So I think $3 a square foot for utilities, $30 a square foot for rent, and $300 a square foot for payroll. Better ventilation and air quality. And I say this now, and I think I'll say it again later. I might say it three more times. I know that when I'm in a place with fresh, clean, nice air, I feel better and I know I'm gonna operate better. And by improve, improving your ventilation and air quality can improve employee productivity by 11%. To put that into like a real world number, if you're $300 a square foot for payroll and you have a 10,000 square, square feet worth of offices, that's gonna equate to around $300,000 worth of productivity. So if you do have an office of that size, you can get to a place where increasing your air quality can increase productivity enough that you're essentially saving a person or two. And, uh, we're not, by saying that, it sounds like a slippery slope. We're not advocating to go squeeze your employees or beat them and just try to get more out of them by, by increasing ventilation or take away their vacation time or something. It's just something natural that will happen. You know, happy people work. We're happy to do things. You're going to get a better talk about ionization. And before we get started, we're going to focus on Dan's screen. He has a little demonstration of smoke in the box with an ion generator. And give me just a second. There you go, Dan. So there's the smoke in the box. You can see the ion module in there. And when the little green LED comes on, it'll start to dissipate that smoke. Go ahead, go ahead, Dan. There's the green light. You can even see the smoke start moving. And in very short order, you can now see all the internal details of that box with the ion block. And what's going on in there is it's emitting negative ions and they're going around and joining with the positive ions of that smoke and they're looking for a ground, which is that metal plate inside of there. And I think if we look at that box, uh, you can tell there's no way that that smoke's escaping. The ion generator did that work. Uh, do you want to show that meter, show it with the uh, box closed and then open the box, I think. 
So that little cell on the right of that meter is showing you negative ions per cubic centimeter. And let us know when the box is open. That box just opened. You saw before it was open, you were at about a thousand. Bring it a little closer there. There we go. That's the sensing side of that unit. Woo, holy smokes. I don't know what that is, but it's a big number. It was like 14,000, 18,000 per cubic centimeter. Uh, those things put off uh, millions of negative ions per cubic centimeter at their source. You can see just barely on the bottom left of your screen where the box is and that it's reading well over, I think I it's maxing out the meter actually, which is good. So a whole lot of ions coming off that. Okay. Yeah. So we can do those uh, demonstrations live, uh, however you would like to see it, or if you just want to see it again one-on-one, -on -one, or even get a little, uh, one of those boxes to do demonstrations for customers you might have, uh, you can get one of those from us. So the, the basic premise of what's going on in that box is negative ions are being emitted which attach to positively charged ions, which typically anything that we would consider bad in the air, pathogens, dust, allergens, VOCs, that includes bacteria and viruses, those are positively charged particles. And what happens in nature, that's why there's a picture of the waterfall and the nice mountain scene there, where water strikes itself, negative ions are, are naturally created. So if you're standing near a waterfall, or if you're, right before a thunderstorm comes, you can feel that nice crispness in the air. You're essentially surrounded with those negative ions and they bind to those positive, positively charged particles uh, and they, correct, they affect essentially how they're charged to where they go start looking for our ground. You will hear some people who speak about ionization that now the cluster is so large it falls to the ground, which is some cases that is true. But what's actually happening is they're looking for a ground and that can be a wall or the floor, uh, something inside of ductwork. And for a virus in particular, once that negative ion attaches to the coronavirus, it affects the RNA and the virus can no longer convert energy and they die off on their own. So the ionization doesn't directly kill the virus, but it inhibits its ability to multiply, mutate, and uh, convert energy. So it dies. And even if you do inhale an ionized virus or particle, it can't, uh, it can't affect you. Uh, other things, I mean, there's... Ionization doesn't go out and specifically target viruses and that, that kind of stuff. So also, if you have, uh, you know, an area with mold issues, uh, libraries, and you give introduce humidity into a library for just a few hours, and you're going to have a tremendous mold issue on books. An ionized space does not allow mold growth. It can help with that. It can also help with uh, radon in your basements. So, uh, and then finally... There is research that supports that negative ions improve mental health and can boost immune and cognitive function. And um, the only thing I can say to that is right there, you're returning your indoor environment to a natural state. I completely believe that my mental health and cognitive function is a little bit enhanced when I'm sitting in a scene like that where that mountain is in that little pond. So I, uh, I completely understand how that would work because that's what we're doing. We're bringing in those particles that, uh, we currently don't have enough of indoors. I think before we go into why it's the best reason, I also wanted to highlight that when you think about the indoors, we're bringing in negative ions, you will say, whoa, what, what happens when I bring these things in? But there's, question, there's a simple question we're not asking ourselves. If you're sitting in front of a laptop, or if you have a flat screen monitor, or if you're carrying a cell phone, or if you're sitting near a server rack, all of these things are natural producers of positive ions, and they have been proven the opposite, that they can increase stress. So we have brought in all these devices of convenience that produce positively charged particles. We've never asked, should we be bringing them in? Now we're just trying to equalize it back the way it was. So there's a choice. You can take all your electronics out of the building, or you can introduce ionization. Uh, what makes it the best solution for air purification? It is the, the most cost effective. So I think in, if you're going to do everything you can to make your building as safe as possible, you would do UV. 
for your surfaces. You would have UV in the space for when it's unoccupied. You'd have it in the duct. You would replace all your filters with HEPA filters. You would install ionization and you would definitely retrofit or add a ventilation sequence to your controls. But not everybody has the first cost budget for that. Ionization can be the first thing and it's a little bit, well, it's a lot easier to get installed first and it's active immediately for people in the space after it's installed. The installation itself is very easy. Ion blocks are very small. They can be mounted in any HVAC system regardless of the size type and they're low voltage. So your facility manager, um, any contractor, if you bought them for your home, you can put them in your home. They are low voltage, just 24 volts. Uh, you get them a signal and they will fire up um, without, without too much trouble getting them installed. Uh, they're very low maintenance. So there are a couple different models. They come with two to five year warranties, uh, which is pretty good warranty for anything you can buy uh, off our shelves these days. And the maintenance is very simple. There's two little brushes. Those little brushes are made of carbon fiber. Those brushes by their nature are attracting dust and dirt and they do need wiped off, which you would typically do anytime you would change your filters. And again, we're gonna restate that they are wiping the air clean, neutralizing odors, allergens, bacteria, viruses, mold spores, and VOCs. Remove contaminants and odors from the air. So that is the last part of that. Even smells, which are actual particles floating around that are typically positively charged or being neutralized by ionization. So plenty of good reasons to use that product. and. Uh, all the products that are offered like it. Um, the four uh, options before we get to the fifth one on the next slide, there's Jackson Control's very simple ion block. That block right there uh, can treat up to 2,500 CFM of airflow. And you size that according to how much CFM you have. So if you have 25,000 CFM of air, you would simply put 10 of those in the airstream of whatever kind of air handling unit you have. And then there's also products from GPS, New Calgon, and Plasma Pure. They all do a little bit different things. They can come in NEMA 4 casings. They can have analysis. They can be connected to building automation systems. Uh, they can be set to auto clean or you know, automatically come on and off, whatever you would need for your, for your facility. A new product. Uh, from Jackson Control. This is the Aircoy Mobile Ionization. So this is a livery product for vehicles. Uh, also easy installations, no modifications to e existing fan equipment. It can be mounted directly to the existing air distribution system. So typically you see in a school bus or an ambulance or a large livery vehicle like that, where you've got, uh, you have your, your fan in the dash, but typically in the back there's a heater. When you get out west, there's air conditioning units in the roof of the buses. They can be installed in there, again, very small. We'll show a video in just a second. It's pretty much the same product as you would see in other ionization products. There's not a whole lot of difference from product to product to product. Low maintenance, you're just wiping those brushes during the regular maintenance of whatever unit they're in. Neutralizes all the same odors, bacteria, viruses, mold spores, and VOCs, and that unit has a two-year warranty. Uh, I think... If we stop sharing you, I'm going to share my screen and show the video. This is a school bus that was done in Nevada, and the unit that this was installed on is a air conditioning unit in the roof, and it is our own Dan Evans narrating this video. Here we go. Today we're in Las Vegas. Ionization install. We have an ionization meter. It's right about uh, 1500, 1600. That's two zeros onto that of ionization. We're going to walk in the bus without fans running and we'll see what the numbers do. Here we are walking in. Numbers are going up 26, 30, 32,000 parts per cubic centimeter, 45. Thousand parts per cubic centimeter of ionization throughout the bus with the ionization blocks we installed in the upper unit here. And here is the lights to show you that the units are on and working. That's Jax Control Air Coy Ionization. So before we go back to 
the presentation with Nicole. I'm going to I have a Aircoy box right here. Looks like Dan has one too. You can see him in the little screen up there at the top. So it's pretty simple what comes in this kit. What makes this different from other ion blocks is that everything's remote. So when you have these are your emitters, instead of being fixed to the top of the ion block, as it would typically, these are remote. So they're in the unit wherever you need them. You can place them at the optimal distance that these emitters need to be from each other. And then also that LED indicator, you saw how that was in that unit and you could see the little LED sticking out. You wanna make that visible. So the block is up in the unit in the airstream, the emitters are where they need to be. The LED is indicating that it's on and running. Then you just open that up and clean it. What comes in the kit, there are install kits. Can't really see in there, but you've got fuses and adapters. And then also some nice materials. If you wanna tell people what you were doing, put a sticker on the bus, make sure parents, kids, families, administrators know that it is uh, inside that vehicle is being cleaned. So there's fuel block, some wire ties, and nice little setup. You can get that right from us. I'm going to spotlight Dan's screen because I can tell he is holding up a typical bus heater. First, I have to stop spotlighting me, start spotlighting Dan Evans. So there's the bus heater right there. Dan, I don't know if you are talking because this time you really are muted. Uh, but you can see, you can see the ion block right there to the side of the box. And you can see that green bundle of cables where the LED is, and that is sticking up through there. So if this bus was installed, say, under a seat, you would be able to look and see the LED indication. The ion block is very nice and tight. And then you can just see the two emitters in there that are inside that fan casing just a little bit. So they're getting in that airstream. And again, those are emitting millions of negative ions per cubic centimeter. They're being distributed by that fan. So you would have that fan on to distribute air in that, uh, in that vehicle. Very nice. Okay, now we can go back. Next slide. Oh, there's a little picture of what we showed. That picture had the little bracket, uh, which I didn't hold up for whatever reason, but that bracket uh, can either be screw mounted, that distance right there that that bracket is set for. So you can use that bracket as a guide to just show the optimal distance apart that the emitters should be, even if you're not gonna use it. And if you are gonna use it, uh, you can either screw it in, and it also comes with magnets, uh, pretty strong magnets, that if you have a magnetic surface near your airstream, you can stick it right in there and get that installed very, very easily. Mm -hmm. Thomas, I missed you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dan. Um, okay, so... Okay. <laughs> How to improve IAQ. Um, I, I chuckle here because uh, I'm thinking of a saying a great man once taught me, and it's a very simple saying. And that saying is, what gets measured gets managed. So to that end, sensor data you collect over time will identify issues. So IAQ monitoring is most valuable when it's done continuously. It can be part of a long-term strategy though for maintaining a healthy building. And it helps you with the following. So number one, it helps you to understand and evaluate your building's current indoor air quality. It allows you to take targeted action to reduce pollutants and fix ventilation areas fast. Um, it allows you to stay within desirable indoor air quality parameters going forward by utilizing alerts and notifications. And lastly, and probably most importantly, it allows you to reassure occupants and other stakeholders that indoor air is safe uh, and it's being treated and you can do it on a nice little visual dashboard that they can verify that on. So let's look at some IAQ sensors. These are just some examples uh, that we come to appreciate. It should be noted there are many, many more, but these are just a few examples that we like. So the first one is the Delta Uno. It's an IAQ monitoring solution uh, that is in line with the well healthy building trend. It provides smart management platform and a mobile app 
to continuously monitor air factors and environmental quality values while allowing you to control fresh air equipment and HVAC systems. It does monitor for particulate matter, for VOCs, for carbon dioxide, for ozone, and for formaldehyde. The second one there in the middle is the BAPI stat sensor. It's able to measure a space and indicate whether it's occupied by measuring VOCs, not carbon dioxide, but VOCs. Uh, and it also does this in, accord, in accordance with ASHRAE's base VRP schedule. So the advantage of VOC sensing as opposed to only measuring for CO2 is that it of course measures air contaminants from the other sources as we previously discussed with VOCs like building materials, cleaners, perfumes, furniture, and carpet off-gassing. It can then be used for demand controlled ventilation. And the last one there on the right is the Honeywell C7355. It's a uh, workhorse multi-sensor that monitors temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, VOCs, uh, all in one. And it can be a duct or wall mounted module. It then of course will uh, integrate with your building management system. So looking at some tools, for indoor air quality. Um, these are just a few example. Again, there are many, many more, but these are just tools that we've come to like through trial and error. So the first one is an Andes ion meter. It's, it's a similar version to the one Dan was showing you in the, uh, on the ion box demonstration. So these meters measure positive and negative ions in real time. They're great for pre and post installation of needlepoint bipolar ionization verification and then on-demand checkups. So I know a lot of facility managers that carry this around with them on a weekly basis just to check uh, occupied spaces for ionization after an install is complete. The second one is an RLE package. So RLE has a nice package that we can temporarily monitor indoor air quality. It uses Wi-Fi or 900 megahertz and it has a gateway for any of these discussed IAQ sensors. So without running wires, uh, one could set up a temporary indoor air quality setup for verification. That little calculator there in the middle uh, indicates sizing and efficiency calculators. So we have sizing and efficiency spreadsheets for ionization and for ventilation for ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation standard. You could probably spend 20 to 30 minutes on that, but uh, reach out to us if you'd like to see it. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, the fourth one there is the GPS eye measure. So that is an ion detector. It can be permanently mounted in a space to measure ion levels in real time. And it does indeed report that back to a building automation system. And then the last one is the Senseware and it's a, uh, a combination sensor. It has a real attractive dashboard for volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, temperature, humidity, and ionization levels uh, for real-time analysis, trending and alarming. So I think that is all she wrote. Is there any questions? No, no questions, but I will ask you to mute. Sounds a little weird. I'm going to stop that share and share a large picture of Matt Montgomery's face. No. So what we've really got here is uh, just a sample of one of the calculators that we we're mentioning. Uh, can you see that on your screen? Yes. yes. So this is a calculator. There's a couple tabs here. Uh, we will gladly get into a presentation, send you a copy of this and show you how to use it. But essentially you're selecting what type of room or building you are in, the occupancy limit, what's going on. Everything is associated with exercise. So typical offices, uh, we do have a, a button for a typical office environment, but then what level, what, what are people doing in that room? So if it's a gym, it would change the way that uh, that air is calculated. Use this guide to pick how your air is being distributed. And any cell that is blue, you enter the information it's asking for. It's going to calculate everything else. The nice part about this is down at the bottom, it is showing you these VOCs, what the ASHRAE levels are and whether or not your space is passing. So you can make intelligent decision on what to do with your space. It also takes into account location, load calculations of your equipment, ventilation increases, and whether that's gonna cause you to have a penalty in your energy usage or a savings, which could be either. And then at the end, there's a financial summary. If you need to go through that, 
as you're evaluating what it is you're going to do. So very useful calculator um, that we can share with you and give a little demonstration on. Then I think, Nicole, if you don't mind sharing that last slide again, you can put up the email address, which is iaq at jacksoncontrol.com. If you have any questions about anything in the presentation or you'd like to have a presentation of your own, or you'd just like to get a set of the tools or a copy of the presentation, just email iaq at jacksoncontrol.com and we will get that to you. And we'd like to help you in any way we can. Thanks for checking out.